Good morning or uh, good afternoon to those of you who are joining us on the East Coast. Um, welcome to this Montana Book Festival event, The Right Love with Sarah Gerard and Andrew Martin. My name is Lauren Korn. I'm the director of the Montana Book Festival. Thank you for joining us today and thank you to our collector's edition sponsor, Whitefish Review, for supporting us and in doing so, supporting contemporary literature in the American West. A shout out too to Missoula's Good Food Store. Our festival would not be possible without the support of these and other sponsors. We're really excited to welcome Sarah and Martin today. Hi, you two. Um, I'll read their bios and then they'll, they'll jump into it. Sarah Gerard's essay collection, Sunshine State, was a New York Times editor's choice, a finalist for the Southern Book Prize and was long listed for the penned Diamondstein Speak Bogle Award for the Art of the Essay. Her novel Binary Star was a finalist for the Los Angeles Times, uh, oh, Los Angeles, oh, I totally missed that, Los Angeles Times Art Speed and Bond Award for the first fiction and was a best book of the year at NPR, Vanity Fair, and BuzzFeed. Her latest novel, True Love, uh, her latest novel is True Love. Her short stories, essays, and interviews have appeared in Guernica, The New York Times, T Magazine, Granta, The Baffler, The Believer, Vice, Electric Literature, and the anthologies We Can't Help It If We're From Florida, One Small Blow Against Encroaching Totalitarianism, and Tampa Bay Noir. Andrew Martin's first novel, Early Work, was a New York Times notable book of 2018 and a finalist for the Catbill First Novelist Award. His stories and essays have been published in the Paris Review, the New York Review of Books, Harper's, and T, the New York Times Style Magazine. He lives in New York with his partner, Laura, and their dog, Bonnie. Uh, hi, you two. Uh, I'm gonna hand it over to you. And yeah, welcome. Hello. Thank you, hello. Uh, Andrew, you're gonna read first. Great. Um, yeah. Um, but uh, so I'm going to read from my, um, a story in my new collection, Cool for America. Um, but I also just want to say like, hello, and I'm happy to be virtually in Missoula. And I really wish I was there in real life. Um, you know, I lived there for a while and love the program, love the city and um, wish I could be there. But uh, instead, I'm here virtually, and I'm going to read a short passage um, from a story called Short Swoop, Long Line that's about um, being in Missoula. OK. So this is from the middle of a story, but I just thought it would be a nice little bit to read. Um, he sat on his front porch after work, drinking a beer. It was his fourth fall here in Missoula, and he couldn't imagine getting sick of the evening light. He'd come to town as a transfer student at the university after two years of misery at Amherst, where both his parents and three of his cousins had gone. He hadn't been able to deal with all the New England horse shit, the barber coats, the sports, the interest in the goddamned leaves. Plus, he was on the verge of failing out. On a trip home, a pothead friend from high school rambled at him about how state schools in the West loved out-of-state underachievers because they were usually willing to pay the hiked-up full tuition. Alex applied to the universities of Montana, Colorado, and New Mexico without telling his parents. When he finally told his father that he'd gotten into UM, his father told him he was disappointed that he wouldn't graduate from Amherst, but not about paying 25 grand a year less for his education. And surprise, in a direct rebuke to American good sense, getting 2,000 miles away from Massachusetts brought out a latent interest in literature and philosophy. The weed was better, the beer was cheaper, and he had teachers who were impressed by what he'd picked up in his previous years of overeducated sleepwalking. He managed to talk his way into some master's seminars in English and film, women's pictures, Pym, Stanwyck, and the uses of melodrama, and graduated with good grades and moderate camping skills. He stuck around town doing what there was to do, stocking shelves at the organic grocery store, hustling the occasional band profile for the Alternative Weekly. When the lone full-time employee of the small bookstore followed his girlfriend to Seattle, Alex was the first person the owner called since he was the only customer under 40 who bought hardcovers on a regular basis. He'd been writing staff picks and restocking the shelves now for a year, despite his father's bi-weekly pleas for him to come back east and get a real job or at least go to law school. And he did still feel the melancholy of being far from home, the huge teeming country between him and everyone he'd grown up with. He spent his Sunday mornings watching football games alone at the cinder block dive in the center of town regretfully eating two to seven slices of the free pizza provided by the guys from the Philadelphia themed sub shop across the street. 
he would order something easy on the stomach to start, a Miller Lite maybe, and work his way up to the hearty local beer by halftime. He'd smoke cigarettes outside at commercial breaks with the scruffy guys in hunting gear, looking at the photographs of large dead animals on their phones, resisting the urge to snicker at their outsized pride. Together, they watched the college girls following their own weekend rituals, some in sweaters on their way out to brunch with their parents, others disheveled in skirts and heels, still trying to put an end to the night before. Watching them only two years out himself, he found himself grateful that he'd made it through this part of his life alive and relatively unscathed. I think that's enough. I'll leave it, leave it there for now. <laughs> I love it. Um, thanks. And thanks to Fact and Fiction for selling books for this event. And thanks to Montana Book Festival for having me and putting me in conversation with Andrew. Because um, I feel like there's a lot of overlap and our, our, our characters, I feel, could exist in the same or similar world. So um, it's, I'm excited to talk about that. Um, I'm actually going to read an essay that I wrote about writing True Love, which is this book, which came out in July. Um, that, uh, and I published the essay on LitHub uh, when the book came out. So it's called On Falling in Love with Your Characters. <clears throat> in All About Love, Bell Hooks defines love as the will to extend oneself for the purpose of nurturing one's own or another's spiritual growth. She continues, growing up is at heart <clears throat> the process of learning to take responsibility for whatever happens in your life. To choose growth is to embrace a love that heals. Growing and healing are functions of living organisms. We refer to an author's body of work because images and ideas recirculate as through the bloodstream, carrying oxygen and nutrients for vital functions. We nurse stories, labor to deliver them. The act of writing is physical and biological. Therefore, writing supports life. Therefore, writing is love. I began writing True Love in the fall of 2016. Trump had just been elected. My marriage was ending. What I've learned about writing about love is that it can be excruciating. Each time I revised true love, I revised myself. I did so with the intention of exposing new layers of truth and meaning in my work, my life, and my world. That's what literature is for, revealing truth and making meaning. I thought true love was a short story, then a cultural history, then a novel in the third person past tense, then present tense, then first person present with several front loaded chapters of backstory, then a subplot involving a fringe conspiracy theory. I carried the project through three years of drafts because if I hadn't, I might never have learned what I needed to learn from it. I might never have healed or grown. My conception of love had suffered a trauma and I'd begun writing to account for it. Healing takes time, love is patient. While revising True Love, I taught a writing class on love at a small liberal arts college in central Florida. We talked about the heart as a metaphor. We talked about the problem of cliches. A cliche is thoughtless, whereas love is thoughtful. A cliche reproduces ideas originating in the culture, not in lived experience. It is antithetical to love because whereas love is alive, a cliche is dead. It's an empty husk. Many of our cultural ideas about love, when we examine them closely, are not true, nor do they encourage growth or healing. In his essay, Visibility, Italo Calvino asks us to consider, reconsider the genesis of the imaginary at a time when literature no longer refers back to an authority or a tradition as its origin or goal, but aims at novelty, originality, and invention. Love is transformative, ecstatic, painful, carnal, wailing, hungry. It's not a box of chocolates. It breathes and it beats. The first prompt in the love class was to write about someone they had hurt. An exercise in compassion, I believe this would be more fruitful for the purpose of investigating love than writing about someone who'd hurt them. It forced them as writers to be active agents in their stories, to imagine another person's pain and take responsibility for it. It's much easier to be generous in writing if the subject is alive and can bleed. Some of the people they were writing about had also hurt them, but hurt feelings tend to sit at the surface. When I asked them to trust that they're I asked them to trust that their hurt feelings would find their way into the story without their assistance. The result would be more complexity, which is also to say more honesty. If love is nurturing growth and growth entails taking responsibility, then healing comes about through an honest depiction of agency. Honesty is the foundation of true love. In true love, my narrator Nina is a liar. Her lying forms the novel's central conflict. 
consequences mount as a result of her inability to be honest with herself or those around her in her pursuit of love. If love is a feeling as well as an action, then so is the absence of it. Nina's lying is a kind of violence she wields in response to pain. Bell Hooks teaches us that violence is antithetical to love because it is used for manipulation and control. Though Nina acts from pain, she also chooses to avoid the work necessary for healing, and she hurts other people as a result. Knowing Nina's flaws, as an author, I love her and my readers as well through my commitment to accepting who she is and depicting her honestly. Love for me is seeing and holding all of Nina, her pain and humor, desire and avoidance, generosity and rationalizations, false justifications, cowardice and shame. Novelist Marcel Savageau writes in her novel commentary that nothing is more endearing than weaknesses and faults. It's through them that one penetrates the beloved soul. A loving portrait includes flaws. At one point in my writing of True Love, an editor reached out to me asking if I'd like to do a feature story for her magazine's February issue. A local lifestyle publication, she requested that the article, in addition to being about love, also touch upon the college's relationship to the surrounding area. I wrote about how several of my students were survivors of the mass shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida the year before. How many of them identif identified as queer and feared for their lives after the Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando the year before that. And yet how voters in the surrounding area of the college continued to elect officials who voted against gun restrictions or legal protections for LGBTQI plus people, officials who had done nothing to protect their constituents after either of these shootings. The, editors, the editor thought guns were too heavy for Valentine's Day. She requested that I instead describe how my students define love now, never mind that their definition of love was intricately tied to their feelings about guns. What should I do? I asked my students. Some thought I should still write the article, use the magazine as a platform, they said. Others thought it wasn't a platform if I couldn't say what I needed to say. Could I have written an article that supported growth and healing even if I couldn't address my reader with what I felt was the full truth? Half truths are lies. I couldn't, in writing about love, compartmentalize the very real adjacent violence. I told my students I'd decline to revise it. We read Audrey Lorde's Uses of the Erotic. Lord teaches us that the erotic is a source of power and that our power proceeds from the depth of our feeling. For the erotic is not a question only of what we do, it's a question of how acutely and fully we can feel in the doing. The authenticity of an author's voice proceeds from the depth of feeling from which she writes. It's an inextricable, it is inextricable from her commitment to writing honestly. There's love and then there's true love. I met my true love, Patty Yumi Cottrell, soon after I began writing true love. Lord continues, once we know the extent of, to which we're capable of feeling that sense of satisfaction and completion, we can then observe which of our various life endeavors brings us closest to that full, fullness. Patty and I had read and admired each other's books. In the beginning, we lived on opposite coasts and exchanged love letters. There's no more intimate form of address than from one lover to another, other than perhaps an author to her reader. I forget while I'm writing that the end result takes place in public. For so long, I labor alone with myself, groping toward honesty and can be clumsy where I need to be sensitive. I forget that I'm responsible to my reader and the world at large, mishandle what's too personal, too real. Patty read every draft of true love. They struggled when it was obvious I wasn't being honest enough, when I wasn't speaking the full truth. They loved me anyway and helped me grow. Janet Malcolm says autobiography is an act of self-forgiveness, but all worthwhile writing approaches forgiveness. I forgive Nina as well as myself for our messiness, stubbornness, and circuitous paths to learning. We are doing our best. We're human. Forgiveness is the deepest expression of love. Patty has taught me this. I said so in my wedding vows last November. There was an exhibit at the local children's museum when I was a child called the Touch Tunnel. In it, you groped, toward a, long, you groped along a dark tunnel on your hands and knees with only your touch to navigate. You encountered a range of textures along the way, rabbit fur, astroturf, sandpaper. It was this uneasiness about what you'd find next that urged you on. You knew if you pushed through the fear of new sensations, you'd so soon emerge into light. Someone would be there to find you. Love is feeling and action. What we really want is to be held. Writing about love is a lot like love itself. I feel my way through on hands and knees face the same rejection, carry resentment, dodge responsibility, hurt people without meaning to. My feelings and perspectives in my work change over time. I fall out of love and in with it again. I need it, hate it, long for it, ghost it, lie to it, beg it to forgive me. At the end of it, I find the one who holds all of me. That's it. 
That's so incredible. Um, it would be good for us to start with like a basic definition of love and like what it means to write about love. So thought it was appropriate. Also, it talks about my true love, so couldn't really be a better time to read that. <laughs> oh, exactly. And a conversation about love. <laughs> no, it's wonderful. Um, well, and I was thinking, I mean, it's interesting because I was thinking while I was rereading your book last night too, that, um, and then you, you said it in the essay as well, that um, pain and love are, are very much entwined in, in your conception of it as a, as a writer, I think. And then when you're talking about um, saying that to your students, I was like, okay, so that, that really is a big part of it. Um, I think those things, they feel very inextricable in life. And then I think like maybe to make them visible on the page, that pain needs to be very evident, you know, because it's it's the classic old formulation that, you know, happiness, uh, well, happiness writes white is the, the Tolstoy formulation, but you know, that like somehow it's very hard to convey contentment and, and, and decency and somehow like showing the opposite of it maybe is like part of how we can write about love. Yeah, Patty and I talk about that a lot, and it's actually really hard to write good love. Mm -hmm. It's hard to, and we, well, it was an idea that we stole from Jakira Diaz in, um, in a, uh, she was on a panel last year that we attended at Books or Magic, um, and, and she said the same thing, and we just, and both of us kind of looked at each other because I was revising True Love at the time, and we went, oh my God, yeah, that's the thing, you know? Because when I started writing this book, Patty, um, rightfully pointed out to me that the definition of love I think that I was like proffering in the book was very cynical and that was something that I wanted to talk to you talk about today with you because I think the same is true for a lot of your characters they seem very cynical and and um I had I was surprised when Patty said that because I had thought of Nina as being kind of a hopeless romantic but of course she's very cynical um and rather unforgiving <laughs> at times well too forgiving sometimes and and rather unforgiving at other times but yeah I don't I mean how would you how would you how do you think your characters would define love in Cool for America and do you think they're cynical do you agree that they're cynical it, it's funny like I, I feel I think I feel similarly to you in that I think I think the characters are there's they're they're outwardly cynical as a defense mechanism because I think they are, at the end of the day, romantics, you know? Um, and they're romantic in a similar way to Nina, I think, about, about art. Um, and they're, they're like romantic about the possibilities of sort of transcending their kind of like grubby feelings and their grubby like instincts and unkindnesses and somehow like getting past that in order to like make something real and like hopefully maybe like meet the person who will unlock their own inner decency <laughs> and, and mm -hmm. kindness, you know um but I think for the most part there the, this collection is about characters who are kind of like stuck in between like kind of stuck between like maybe their younger like um, reckless selves and they're sort of groping towards some kind of like maturity or decency and and some of them are sort of achieving it but most of them are continuing to like fuck up and kind of make choices that that are not kind um and it uh, seem like over the course of the collection the characters grow slightly older and a little bit more mature and it's not like they've completely solved their problems, but they have perhaps a bit more perspective, maybe. Yeah. Well, and, and a lot of the time the characters like in the situations, it's showing them at a younger point in their lives. And yeah. then you, you sort of see at some point in the story that it's being told from a slightly more retrospective position. Um, and I sort of, I kind of felt that way about your novel because it, it feels like, even though I don't think there's like a moment where it like truly zooms out it still feels like you couldn't there's no way you could record the like sort of bracing honesty and like difficulty of the situations you're writing about without it being written from a like sort of retrospective vantage point right so somehow when you're reading it you kind of understand that you're seeing something that um has been like processed i think be because of its um 
because of yeah. its honesty and, and sort of clarity. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that I, I couldn't perhaps have written such a problematic character unless I had moved past a point in my life when, you know, uh, I, I had learned those difficult lessons myself, you mm -hmm. know? Um, yeah, I mean, I think if I had to try, tried to, I mean, Nina's very young. She's like in her early to mid twenties. And I think if I had tried to write this novel at that point, there's no way I could have been, um, th that I could have seen like all the way around the situation, you know? Um, and it was a struggle, I think, as I was writing it to figure out how I could, as an author, portray Nina honestly, although the, although she's very self-deluding and the novel is written in a first person present. <laughs> I mean, there, there are, you know, she refers to, there are sections in the past tense, especially in the early part of the book, but um, when she's talking about her childhood and her stint in rehab, but, um, but I, I realized that, that uh, those difficult doses of truth would have to come from the people around her. You know, they would have to be the ones to call her out, like, especially later in the book, after she has fucked up in all these myriad ways and hurt all the people around her. Um, that's when I think she's, that's when she starts to wake up a bit. She never completely wakes up. Uh, perhaps until the very last page and then there's this like dawning moment in the last line but um but you know but she's but the reader I think is getting that is getting that perspective through the people around Nina too and it's like sort of Nina and the reader are learning in tandem you know yeah and I I, I would assume the same is true for you like probably you wouldn't have been able to write these characters in the very messy way that you did unless you unless your own life was not so messy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, some of the some of the earliest stories in the book, um, and you know, there it's like kind of the the order running order of the book isn't chronological to when it was written, but some of the oldest stories in the book um, were sort of written or at least begun like in the in the mess, um, like in during like darker, less wise, and not that I've achieved anything like real wisdom, but you know. Um, but then I think like revised and and juxtaposed over time in a way that felt like I can I created I hope like a picture of with enough facets and enough moving parts that it's not you know not just like a portrait of of like youthful nihilism um, even if a couple of the stories are sort of like written in that place um, I mean it's interesting and I feel like you. Um, might have a similar experience where like people will say like, oh, or, or you know, like if, if one can't resist like checking one's Goodreads or something like, oh, these are like, these stories are about like these like lousy people, like the author is a lousy person. And you, and you want to say kind of what you're saying, which is like, it would be really hard to write honestly and clearly about these things if you hadn't sort of like Mm -hmm. process them and, and like tried to like understand because I, I think like what often happens is like in, in in literature that I think like feels insincere um they'll sort of like valorize um certain kinds of like awfulness um which which can be interesting too to be sure but like um I think that's not really like what I'm interested in doing um right yeah and um and I, I was thinking a lot I, I thought this would be an interesting thing to mention is that I, I I think the therapy scenes, the psychoanalysis scenes in your book are like some of the best I've I've read. Um, and it made me realize that I was almost, it's, it's kind of shocking that there aren't more scenes of analysis and therapy in contemporary fiction, considering like every writer I've ever known basically has been in therapy. <laughs> um, yeah. and, um, mm -hmm. and I wonder how you think those scenes function. They're also very funny. Um, which is, which is really great. Um, I don't know, I wonder how you thought about therapy in fiction and like how uh, therapy and how like sort of depicting therapy in fiction works. Well, yeah, I mean, the so-called therapy in true love is um, more- <laughs> Maybe not very like, effective therapy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I was thinking, yeah, well, I mean, it's like a literal, it's supposed to be, well, I mean, at the beginning of the book, oh, where do I begin actually? Okay. so. Um, so in the beginning of the book, Nina is in 
therapy, but well, it's hypnotherapy, mm-hmm. right? So, um, which I've done and I think is actually really fascinating. Um, I fully believe in it and highly recommend it for everyone. It's so cool. Um, and um, just the basic, um, the, the way that it works is really fascinating to me because it has a lot to do with the basic anatomy of the body and the brain and, um, and the vagal system and the, you know, uh, and deep memory and trance, which is actually a, a, a definition of love that I explore in the book, not the only definition of love that I explore in the book. There are lots of them, but that I kind of offer up as possible explanations for what love is. But, um, but one possible explanation is that it's, um, it's a trance, you know, and I, and if you look up the definition of trance, you'll see that it's actually true. It's like a, and it's in the book. It's a, it's basically just the way you see the world, you know, it's a, it's a, a, a lens onto the world. So, so those hypnotherapy scenes are, I think of them as a sort of lens. Um, you can actually witness Nina in the, in the hypnotherapy scene, falling in love with Seth, her, her boyfriend. Um, and you can see how and why it's, it is a trance. And then uh, the, in the later part of the book, she, Nina goes to analysis. Um, and, and I think of those scenes as being a literal analysis of what of everything we have just witnessed um, and more. And, um, and I, I kind of play with the idea. I mean, I think analysis is really, I think psychoanalysis is kind of funny and, and also an interesting way of seeing the world and thinking about love because it's so symbolic. Um, it's so much like, I mean, there are scenes of, of dream analysis in those scenes and Nina attempting to engage her analyst in a sort of love relationship and, um, or, you know, I mean, you can see the transference happening, you know, yeah. and the, <laughs> the counter transference and, um, and then you can see her sort of trying to jockey her, her partner into analysis too. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I was thinking of those scenes as containers and modes of writing and thinking, I think. Um, yeah. yeah, like those scenes are kind of, uh, they give, they give the story of a structure, a periodic structure, you know, like in analysis, it's easy in the analysis scenes to just let Nina talk because the analyst doesn't talk, <laughs> which is right. kind of like classical analysis, you know, where the analyst is just like silently on the couch. And I think even at one point, Nina's like, are you awake? And um, <laughs> yes. which is also a question. <laughs> yeah, yes. And he's very, you know, um, and it's also interesting too, because the book is um, a satire of toxic masculinity. Uh, or like the father figure too, you know, and here's her analyst, very masculine, very male analyst, very serious figure, uh, kind of in a way like um, a stern father, you know, so, um, and then I don't want to give away what happens, but it turns out to be more true than she thinks. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Does that answer your question? <laughs> uh, no, it, actually, it does. Yeah. I mean, speaking of stern father figures, like something that I wanted to talk to you about too is just the various relationship types that are presented in uh, in your book. I mean, these because it's not just since we're here talking about love. I guess I should say like that we're not only talking about romantic love, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you're in your book, especially like you're exploring sibling relationships and relationships with parents and relationships with uh, uh, that parents have with their children um so i mean yeah does your definition of love change in in those um or is the way you approach writing about it different in those instances i think that's such a good a good thing to think about um because i'm i find myself writing more and more about family um and i like my first novel early work which which kind of is in the same universe as this collection there there's very very little um it it really is extremely zoomed in on sort of like uh a a romantic relationship and like a few friends and it's really as if like i don't know it's almost like they're the the lost boys from peter pan or something where they're like um they they kind of are disconnected from from the family structure um whereas in this book and in the like novel i'm trying to write now 
it's very much about how one is sort of embedded in family and how one is, um, you know, there's, there's all kinds of complications um, that, that arise from family relationships. Um, and I think they're like for in, in my own case, like in my life, like I have obviously like tons of conflicts with my <laughs> parents and sisters, but also there is, I have like had a very like sort of secure relationship with them at the end of the day. And so I think a lot of what, when I write about family, it's like sort of about the inevitability of one's relationships and, and relationships that you can't sever and, and can damage and that create all sorts of difficulties and unhappiness. Um, but that at the end of the day, um, it's about how do you continue to like live with these people and how do you find forgiveness and, and like kindness and um, I mean, I think forgiveness is the big thing, um, because I think in the, the stories in The Changed Party and in um, Short Swoop Long Line, they're, they're really about um, parents and children um, and like trying to, to reckon with, you know, in, in one, The Changed Party is from the point of view of a parent dealing with a, a child who's going through um, kind of some OCD issues is, is one of the threads of that story. And sort of trying to understand her and trying to be generous and but also like not doing a very good job of it. Um, and then in short swoop long line it's the, the, the central character is a young man who feels sort of unseen or underseen by his father. Um, and, you know, is really struggling with like what what he means to his father what his father means to him and like whether they, they can understand each other or whether there's like sort of going to be an eternal gulf in 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 understanding. Um, so I, I think like, for me, the, 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 the family stuff is always about like, the space between what you're imagined to be by your family because of the familiarity and like what you really are, and, and how you can. Um, I mean, this this sounds so much like a Freudian psychoanalysis, but uh, it's certainly on our minds today. Uh, you know, that, that there's always like this sense of projection and like how you can actually how you can show your true self and whether that's possible, um, which um, I'm just improvising here, but um, this sort of, I don't know. I, I was thinking a lot like Mike, because you talked about love so much in your opening monologue, like my original question was like the very, was a very basic question about, but <sighs> true, like the word true is the important word, right? right. Um, mm -hmm. And And it's what the, they're writing a script. She, the, the Nina and her t husband to be, are writing a script called True Love. Um, it's kind of, it, it feels deeply ironic that that this is what they're calling their script. Um, but you know, when I when I was looking closely at the book, there are all these moments where where Nina really does think she's in love and says mm -hmm. she's in love and and really feels herself to be in love, and yet while in love, will immediately go and you know start like a weird text uh, relationship with somebody new or something, you know? So it's like, mm -hmm. what do you think true, like true love, and, and you say it in your essay, but in the context of this book, what is the, what is true love versus sort of like false, yeah. false love? It must be the opposite of true love. <laughs> well, I think any kind of love that's founded on a lie is not true love. Uh -huh. So, um, so in the sense that Nina, cannot be honest with herself she also cannot be honest with other people and therefore mm -hmm. uh is very self-defeating in her pursuit of true love and mm -hmm. and and were she to find true love it would entail a radical gesture of honesty you know um mm -hmm. just a, a huge uh and you know rapid growth spurt in her growth um, and probably, well, I mean, another definition of love that I offer up in the book is like, perhaps it's an addiction of sorts. It's something that like she, or, you know, I think the kind of love that she finds is really compulsive and, um, and, is, and is kind of antithetical to what I would call true love because true love is patient and knowing and wise and complex and contradictory at times and, um, and her mother, her mother says she's addicted to falling in love. Yeah, and exactly. That's, like, that's a different thing, maybe. Than, than totally. 
and the right, right. experience of, of, of the act itself. Yeah, I think Nina is, <clears throat> I think Nina likes the feeling of the fall. It's like, um, mm -hmm. it's like, a, what's the word I'm looking for? It's the adrenaline rush, you know, of like yeah. almost like a, a roller coaster or something, you know, it's that hopefulness and then the fall. Um, and she never reaches the point of, she's a very impatient person and a very defensive person because she's been wounded and hasn't done the, the work to um, heal herself. And so she's always looking to somebody else to do the work for her and that's never gonna happen. It's like, it's like throwing quarters into an abyss and hoping they pay for something, like it's just never gonna happen. Um, so she has to learn how to do that herself. And I know that's a cliche, but I do think it's true. Um, you know, if, and you, you can never really trust that somebody loves you completely unless you show them your full self, your complete self, mm -hmm. you know, um, and ask, and ask them to see, to see that and hold that, you know? Yeah. So, so we're putting a lot on her and I was, I wanted to come back to your earlier um, mention of toxic masculinity because like the, the men in her life are like not, <laughs> not helping, <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. like she, she keeps, and I, and I, I was noting it and there's this like wonderful thread that almost feels like a subtweet throughout the book of the movies that the men are watching in the background, which are <laughs> Lars von Trier's Antichrist, um, <laughs> Boogie Nights and Magnolia, uh, yeah. Blade Runner. It's like a yeah. canon of, of like sort of male dominated and yeah films. um yeah and so maybe you could talk a little bit about that that toxic masculinity and how, how that well, is part of this itch, issue as well <laughs> it's funny I said to Patty earlier I was like I wonder if they paired me with Andrew Martin because his because a lot of his male characters could also be in true love <laughs> you know <laughs> like they're just um yeah I don't know I mean I like I said earlier I feel like our books could possibly inhabit a smaller world you know um because yeah I mean there's um yeah I mean it is yeah true love is very male dominated um on purpose I mean the book is designed that way and the, the women in the book you know and I'll own this they do often fall prey to the men in their life um you know and it's and they're also not helping themselves I mean I think I think what I what, what I wanted to do was not to place blame squarely on any one person or any one type of person in the book. I mean, um, the women also don't really help themselves. Like, and you know, Odessa, her Nina's friend Odessa gets into gets back into a very ill-advised relationship with her daughter's father after he leave, after he gets out of prison. He's on parole for like armed robbery. You know, yeah. Um, so um, and. But, but at the same time, you hear her justification, which is, you know, I can't, I can't do this alone. Like, I, I, it's too exhausting for her to be a single mother. And, and her daughter needs a, a, a father or some other kind of caretaking figure in her life um, because, um, because being a single mother is really hard. Um, so, yeah. But, I mean, certainly there's plenty of fodder in my personal history for you know, writing these, these very toxic male characters too. And, and I'm poking fun at that um, in a loving way, I think, you know, and it is, I, I hope that the male characters, even while being rather insufferable, are also somewhat charming, <laughs> Char charmingly insufferable, even as they're terrible. They're charming right up until they start like throwing things and breaking, right. them, which is like never, never charming, you know. <laughs> it's definitely a range of behavior. Yeah, yeah. I mean, early in the book, there's like there's like the negging behavior, the ghosting behavior, the quote unquote polyamorous behavior. Uh, <laughs> the yeah, I mean, which is just cheating behavior. And um, but then yeah, towards the end of the book you see how all of this is a spectrum, all that behavior is a spectrum and on the far end of that is physical violence and yeah, yeah. other things. So I was actually, I mean, speaking of toxicity, which is something that runs through, through the, my own book in many, many ways, I was thinking about mind altering substances in your book and whether you were thinking of toxicity maybe in a different way, like, you oh. know, toxic substances or 
mind altering substances, which I think both of us are thinking of in our writing, but it seems like you're approaching it maybe a little differently. I mean, yeah, it's, I mean, it, it's really, it runs through the book. Um, like there's, and I, it's one of those things where you, you don't even, I at least didn't even quite realize the degree to which both of my books are just like soaked through with booze and, um, and drugs. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think like, I think there's like in my own life and experience, I think that there's like real uh, insights to be gained from like doing, I don't know, doing mushrooms or, you know, getting stoned um, and a certain amount of, you know, alcoholic camaraderie. Um, but I think like what these books are exploring, I think like pretty accurately in that sense, at least is that like those things become a crutch and become a way to avoid life and to avoid um, true connection, you know? Um, and like the, the story with the Christopher kids, um, you know, I, I don't want it to be like a PSA, you know, was, was like the, the thing I worry about because, but it's a story about, you know, the main character is, is doing cocaine because he's like upset that his girlfriend broke up with him um, and it's Christmas. And he, you know, basically like, uh enables his sister to fall off the wagon and she's you know in recovery um and she ends up in the hospital as a result um and the story is really about kind of like the cycle of substance abuse and the way that it um perpetuates itself even when it's accidental or even when it's you know um recreational like you know there's a moment where like a doctor asks him like do you do drugs and he's like oh you know like like recreationally sure <laughs> and it's like well you're in the hospital on Christmas morning so like maybe it's not so recreational you know mm -hmm. um, but I do I think in general like alcohol and drugs in my work is, is trying to, to serve right, right as some kind of metaphor as, as well as being literal in that it's often being used by characters to, to avoid um, their lives or, or to like, they're often very passive characters. Um, and I think that's something that, that you write about well as well is, is like sort of the fundamental passivity of some of these men in which, in wh where they like, they want someone else to, to do the work. They want someone else to figure out like what their lives should be mm -hmm. um, and, and it's true of the, the female characters in my book as well like there's there's you know some of the stories of the central characters are um women who are also sort of like struggling to to figure out what they're doing but I think it's like a it's a very much like a thread through the book is this certain passivity and there's like I don't know this desire to like use substances to like activate oneself but as we know like if you activate too much <laughs> or in the wrong direction um you you find yourself in like a pretty dangerous place mm. um, but um I don't know I think it's it's funny in both of these books that um I don't know you, you see what happens like there's a lot of great work in your book about people so, who are like the pressure of of New York and the particular pressure of space, physical space. Um, and it happens over and over again in your novel that these characters are like renting these apartments where they like have no privacy, where, where they're like have to sit in the bathroom is the only place <laughs> where they can be alone. Um, and uh, I think we should move to questions soon, but I wanted, I, that's the last thing I wanted to talk about maybe, because I think it's true in my work too, where these characters are sort of like, part of what arises is because of like the classic like sort of dramatic necessity of characters are just like stuck they're stuck in yeah. a place together and they just pick at each other and nag at each other um so I wanted yeah. to talk about yeah physical how does like physical space function in your work yeah yeah I mean I think that it seems like a lot of the characters in your story find their relationships or their life kind of orientations or the the structures of their lives to be confining, you know, um, and they're looking for 
some escape hatch, you know, and uh, like in one and more than one of the stories, um, they find that through drinking or they leave for the night and show up early in the morning, you know, they just like kind of abandon their families for the night and, but they can't actually physically escape or maybe can't emotionally escape or can't mentally escape or economically escape the situations that they put themselves in, you know, you can't undo being a father, you know, and mm -hmm. it's really hard to leave a marriage, you know? Um, so yeah. And I, so in true love, um, I, I literalized that and, you know, at a certain, I mean, I, I made that really materially manifest in the characters' lives. Um, and uh, it, like I opened the book in Florida, which I'm, I'm here now, Patty and I came down here when the pandemic began because um, we were living up in the greater New York City area and our lease was about to run out and we didn't want to go apartment hunting in a, in a pandemic situation uh, if we even could. Yeah. yeah. And um, so we, you know, we found a, our own escape hatch and we came down to where it's actually physically easier to socially distance, you know, um, which is a great metaphor, socially distancing, you know, um, but in the sense that Nina begins the story there, I thought, you know, as a writer, I'm thinking about all elements of my story as being symbolic. And so I thought, how can I put more pressure on her? Like, what is the most high pressure situation I can put her in and really close the walls in? And I was like, oh, well, obviously she has to go to New York. That's where the walls <laughs> literally close in, you know? <laughs> uh, she can't, she's living in a 400 square foot studio apartment near the end of the book, which is the studio apartment that I was living in for like eight years in New York City. <laughs> No, the, the apartment that I was living in, um, I just, you know, I mean, and as, as, as authors, you know, we, we write the places that we know best. So, um, like you were writing about Montana where you lived, right? I mean, yeah. uh, with everything in your mind, and this is like a very young Ian thing that I think Nina would appreciate at one point, she's like, you might think of this as symbolic, <laughs> um, and what she's describing, but I mean, everything in your mind is a symbol, you know? And so, um it, when you when you read into it that way so yeah um i um in in one sense like nina uh, puts herself into these really confining situations even as she's trying to escape them she makes them worse it, but in another way I, I thought you know nina's having a, an impossible time escaping herself at some point she's going to run right back into herself so yeah uh, yeah, so so that was that's what, that's what I was doing with New York City, and also it was kind of for me like a love letter to New York. I mean, everybody who's lived there has to write one at some point, you know, if you're an author. So that's what I was doing with True Love, and now I will never write about New York again. Just yeah, right. <laughs> no, I'm doing it right now. <laughs> I'm doing it even as we speak. So, There's also no such it. thing as like a pure love letter to New York. It's always like a a, a <clears throat> love letter that's yeah. been like in the gutter, like covered in some dog poop. Yeah. And, Right, exactly. It's like a love-hate letter. It's a breakup letter. <laughs> but, I, but we can't stop writing them. <laughs> I know. Yeah. We have a couple so, of questions. Yeah. Um, um, somebody asked you, I mean, I've talked a lot about Patty, um, but somebody is asking you here about Laura, how much she's a part of your process, your writing process. Oh, that's a good question. And then um, both of our partners are also writers. What effect do they, their input, their own writing processes have on your own writing and processes? Um, yeah. And um, I mean, the truth, like Laura is a, a huge, huge, uh, my partner, Laura Colby is um, a doctor and also an incredibly great poet and essayist and fiction writer. Um, and I mean, like our relationship um, has, I don't know, continued to like, expand and and change my idea of like what fiction can be and what literature can be um and in very direct ways like um you know reading poets and other um essayists and writers who I wouldn't have read if she hadn't read them first and and told me about it but also just I mean I think it's just it's so important in in a writer's life to have someone who's no bullshit and who will call you on your bullshit um and tell you when you're lying to yourself uh, about whether something's good slash, you know, but like in a more, not even just in an aesthetic way, but like in a, like, are you being honest um, on the page? 
uh, you know, like, is this real or are you posturing, you know, are you sort of like imagining that you're saying something profound when really it's actually like um, just a version of sort of your self projection. Um, so I think like just having like a, I don't know, like a serious, I mean, you could, you have friends, but I think when that person is like living with you and, and actually there and like sort of living by example of like how to be an honest person and writer, it's so huge. Um, so yeah, I mean, and, and, you know, we like share each other's work with each other and everything else. Um, what about you? How did, how did, how does, I mean, you, you've said it, you've said it uh, character wise maybe, but uh, yeah. How do you, how do you feel that that relationship affects your writing? Yeah. I mean, in every way, um, I think it's really great that, uh, I mean, Patty, Patty and I, it's hard to even know where to begin because it's such a profound uh, partnership. Um, well, we write together for one thing, which is really wonderful. Um, we we published some fiction to, that we wrote together uh, earlier this summer, and oh, that's cool. Yeah, it was really cool. Uh, it's called Modern Modern Nature, um, and you can find it on Borough Press's website, um, which is a Florida press. And I mean, and we're we're writing a, a book together, um, which is basically a book of essays in the form of love letters and um, which tell a, a, a narrative that's kind of shaped like, uh, like a Mobius strip. Um, so, and we've been working on that together for a few years now, um, but we also have really separate practices that we respect and honor and assist with. Um, I show Patty everything I write and, and I value their opinion tremendously and their feedback has really shaped my work a great deal and helped me to grow, which is, I think, ultimately the point of writing um, is growing and healing and uh, for yourself and for the world. And, um, and yeah, uh, I mean, and just keeping me um, healthy and sane on a day-to-day -day basis is, is really uh, crucial, uh, you know? I mean, there's a period between my first marriage and when I started seeing Patty that um, I was just living a really unhealthy lifestyle, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know, and then Patty swooped in and, and shaped me up. And um, I mean, it's not that I, I can't be an adult without Patty, but, you know, and I can't take care of myself without Patty, but, but their presence really helps. Um, and my, my, and our mutual responsibility for each other, um, you know, I think checks some of our um, habits that might be bad, not only for our health, but our writing, which is, I think the, the health of the larger world as, as well, you know, um, yeah. because we don't write in a vacuum, you know, we write for all of humanity. So, yeah. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think that answers the question, but uh, yeah. what we have, but also, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I Patty recommends books that I would never read otherwise or never even know about otherwise probably and and vice versa. So, um, and we watch movies together and I think just generally live and love the, and love stories together, you know, which is a really profound um, partnership for me. Yeah. I want to, um, I feel like one thing you said kind of leads into another question that um, from my friend, the poet B.J. Saloy, and it's been sort of condensed um, by Jenny to say, as you sit down and write about love these days, you find yourselves embracing the ubiquitous headlines around us, COVID, Trump, BLM protests, COVID, Trump, repeat, or do you feel uneasy hitching your writing to such a particular cultural moment? Um, and I know that I, I find myself really wanting to engage with these things through my fiction. Um, and really struggling to do so be because of that particular sort of time stampness of it. Um, and yet, like, I think you and I have been on similar timelines where, like, I really wrote these two books, like, kind of between, like, 2015, or I don't know, some of the stories predate that by a lot, but, like, all, most of this work predates the, like, sort of hardcore middle of the Trump era um and so it, it's like in some ways my fiction hasn't really 
engaged it that much except for one story in this book. Um, but it feels very hard to be like, we both write about contemporary life. And it's like, so why are these people in their early thirties, like not at protests, <laughs> not, you know, like talking about Trump all the time because like, that doesn't really make sense, you know? Well, I mean, true love spans 2014 to 2016 and it ends, I mean, one of the, one of the, um, the final events in the book is the election of Donald Trump. So, you know, and I think that had to do with the fact that I, I began writing it right after Trump was elected. And mm. so, so much of what was happening as I was writing and revising the book in the Trump election couldn't really make its way into the book because I hadn't really had the time to reflect on it yet. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, I don't know how to, it's hard to explain, but like, you can't write something that expires so quickly that, that well, I, I guess I'm just not that kind of writer, you know, I'm not the kind of person who has an, an, an immediate reaction and can take to the opinion section of the times and really, sh and really tie it up, you know, um, that quickly. Um, and it's not your job as a fiction writer, right? I mean, you're also an essayist, but I mean, you know, um, you know, well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, I'm writing a book of nonfiction right now. It's like, yeah. I've been working on it for four years. And um, so, I, and you know, I write fiction and nonfiction and all of my work is really political, um, but it's not necessarily grappling with things that are happening in the moment, you know, um, or they do, you know, the things that I write about apply to what's happening in the moment, but not necessarily pulling in, you know, the events of today, right now. Yeah. However, the book that I'm writing right now does, um, by the fact of my reporting, what's ha I'm still reporting on it even as I write it. So, mm -hmm. you know, so the reporting pulls it in, but, um, but by the time the book comes out in two or three years, you know, those events will have long since passed. So part of it is just the, the editorial timeline, I think, yeah. and just the amount of time, it's the, you know, publishing industry moves so slowly. Um, yeah. But I do write about things happening right now today. Um, I mean, yeah, I don't know. Does that make sense? No, I mean, of your work is very political too, but also not necessarily, uh, you know, in the, in the op-ed section of the Times, right? I mean, it's true. Sorry, my dog is at my feet. Whenever I'm on Zoom, she just wants to hang out. No, it's true. Um, but I mean, but but I find myself really drawn to, like the the, the novel I'm working on, like is is gonna be a, it, at least like, there's gonna be at least a thread of like, people in political groups like debating, you know, whether like violence is appropriate, you know, or like debating like, you know, like the difference between a, a riot and an uprising. And, you know, like, I think like those, I think like that the last few years have just been so, so explicitly political in a way that um, wasn't, wasn't as true in my life as it, as it, I mean, like I've, I've always been like very politically engaged, but I think like the specific explicit politics of like the day's news um, has like kind of invaded the daily lives of most artists I know in a way that, that feels like it needs to be acknowledged, but I'm not sure how, you know, and, and I think yeah. that that remains the debate is like, and it seems so too easy to have sort of like a virtuous character who's like doing, yeah. doing the right thing politically. And so it has to be something a little bit, I think we both yeah. are like drawn toward the ugliness and the complicatedness, you know, and like that seems like the thing that needs to be dealt yeah. with. I mean, in, in addition to true love being a satire of toxic masculinity, it's also a satire of whiteness. And, mm -hmm. and um, you know, so like Nina is a gentrifier. She and her various boyfriends are moving into traditionally black and brown neighborhoods. And um, that is made really visible in the narrative. And so I think that is some of how the politics of the book enter in is just in the, the, is by the fact of them being made very visible um, she's working in a bookstore where, uh, you know, various coworkers are taking uh, time off to go to protests and, uh, you know, she's putting up displays in the bookstore about the true meaning of Thanksgiving and, um, 
I mean, you can't write about New York without writing about it politically. It's so, such a very political place, as is Florida, actually. I mean, so the opening chapters of the book are, are very political, but it's built into the setting of the book. I mean, there's like- Environmental. A, and an, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. So so that's some of how it enters into fiction and it might not be, I mean, it is often explicitly in the dialogues that she's having with people, but it's um, also more subtle, kind of baked into the setting, um, you know, and the book that I'm writing now too, uh, a lot of it takes place, the, the nonfiction fiction book that I'm writing, a lot of it takes place in a courtroom, you know, so I've, just doing a lot, I've been doing a lot of, I recently attended a try a long trial and, um, so unpacking that in the book is, you know, obviously that's an act of political activism, you know, like what all of this means and the various, um, you know, motions and hearings that, you know, and why these are happening and what does the outcome mean and what are, what are the opinions of all the people involved and how do they feel about it? I mean, all of that is, is very political. So, um, but yeah, I don't know. Does that answer? Does that, I think that answers the question. And I think, yeah, I mean, the narrative, in one way or another, is always a political act. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, Lauren. <laughs> I yeah, I'm just I'm just jumping in. It's um a little past eleven. Um, if you two want to keep talking, I'm fine with that. I just wanted to check in with you, um, to to kind of see where where you are in the conversation. Um, we can certainly wrap it up if that's where you are too. So. Well, put us in the spot like that. It's like, oh yeah. man, Andrew, yeah, do you I want didn't to talk to me or not? <laughs> yeah, I didn't anticipate doing that, but I, I felt like I had to I had to make some sort of move once 11, I guess, or one o'clock in your cases hit. You want to yeah. let, let the people attend more uh, more panels? I, I don't know. Yeah, well, that's true. That's true. Um, well, if that's okay with you, um, I'm going to kind of uh, wrap things up then. Um, that was a really wonderful conversation. I learned so much. Um, Sarah, you said it at one point, like, I, I'm wondering why they paired us together. And I think that um, many of the reasons that you talked about in, in this conversation were certainly reasons yeah. why I'm like, these two books would, um, you know, marry really nicely together. Um, and I just want to say that, um, you know, I've, I know both of you through my book selling days, Andrew, when I, uh, when you lived in Missoula, I was a bookseller. That's how we, I think, first cro crossed paths. And then, um, Sarah, I hosted uh, uh, an event for Binary Star, and you know yeah. we went we went out to uh, you know fried food at the Oxford after. So oh. I just I felt I felt um, a sort of kinship in in bringing you two together. Um, yeah, through my through my book selling days. So um, I'm so thrilled that this conversation worked out and that you were both able to join us today. Yeah, me too. Thank you so much. Thanks, yeah. Andrew, as well, and uh, the, everybody at the Montana Book Festival and everybody who attended. It's been yeah. really a great conversation. Yeah. No, Thank thanks, you. Thanks, Sarah and Lauren. It was, it was really so great to talk to you. We've never met, and this just feel, felt like so yeah. wonderful. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And we have mutual friends too. Yeah, yeah. Hallie, Hallie Butler and the Copley Eisenberg, both of them say hello. And yeah. So we'll meet, we'll meet in real life someday. I, I know it. Someday. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, well, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, thank you um, to all of you who are watching for attending this Montana Book Festival virtual event. I want to shout out Whitefish Review and the Good Food Store one more time. Thank you so much for your sponsorship of this year's virtual events. As a reminder to those of you watching, you can purchase Sarah's True Love and Andrew's Cool for America on Fact and Fiction's website at factandfictionbooks.com. You can also purchase Montana Book Festival merchandise at montanabookfestival.com. Um, I'll, th I'll throw up my copies here too. Um, <laughs> there you can also donate um, at montanabookfestival.com so we can keep virtual programming like this um, into the fall, keep doing stuff like this into the fall with our MBF Plus events. Um, again, Sarah and Andrew, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Lauren. Thank yeah. you. Have a great day. Thanks Bye. a lot. Mm -hmm. Bye.